afraid, have no fear, is the voice we most need to hear. This voice was heard by Zechariah when Gabriel, the angel of the Lord, appeared to him in the temple and told him that his wife Elizabeth would bear a son. This voice was heard by Mary when the same angel entered her house in Nazareth and announced that she would conceive, bear a child, and name him Jesus. This voice was also heard by the woman who came to the tomb and saw that the stone was rolled away. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. The voice uttering these words sounds all through history as the voice of God's messengers, be they angels or saints. It is the voice that announces a whole new way of being, a being in the house of love, the house of the Lord. The house of love is not simply a place in the afterlife, a place in heaven beyond this world. Jesus offers us this house right in the midst of our anxious world. Fear isn't something new for people of faith. Listen to one of the early struggles between fear and faith. In Numbers 13, Moses sends spies into the promised land to check it out. Most of them are fearful, and the fear infects the people. Our reading today from Numbers 14, 1 through 9, uncovers the result of what we nurture and hold on to, fear or faith. Listen now for the reading of God's word. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of God's word. Amen. We've spent the last five weeks focused on this book by Adam Hamilton, Unafraid, and covering a range of of topics from fear of others to fear of failure and fear of loneliness, and um, we continue for the next couple of weeks. And the fear, of course, is not a fear that um, happens when you're startled or scared. There's that level of fear, but it is the sort of fear that keeps us from this, views this as an image of God. That's God's backside with the hair bun there. And that's you and I. That's God's design, that that we're so deep in that relationship that we feel God's holding us no matter what it is that we're we're going through. Um, It's that deep-seated understanding and knowledge that uh, just is even hard to express. It's just something you know. So imagine that fear is like being in a vehicle and driving. 
And, and the, the design, God's design and desire is, is that we are to have some control in our world and in our lives to go. It's also part of God's design and desire that God is, is right here. And there's this ongoing conversation, this ongoing interaction, and God longs to show us the world out there and wants to help us maneuver and blossom and flourish. And we might pass some scary things, and even as we do, we know who sits beside us. We can't necessarily see what's coming except for just a little ways up, but we sit with, we go with, we're moving with the one, you've probably heard that phrase, who holds the future. We don't know what the future holds, but we know the one who holds the future. That's, that's God's design for us as we're journeying through life. And, and yet sometimes my suspicion is we find ourselves just sitting in the vehicle, so to speak. Somehow fear has shut us down, the engine's not on, or, or maybe we're even somewhere else and, and we see this, this vehicle, but we're, we're too afraid to get in. I wonder what sort of fears there are that keep you from that place that God intended and just nurture and stew that fear within. This is the picture I showed the kids. That's my grandfather. Uh, I'm, of course, the cute one on the right, and that's my brother on the left. And one of the things that I remember particularly about my grandfather is how much he wanted to be with my brother and I. He really craved that relationship. We were his only grandkids. And um, and we would play pool when we went to see him. We would uh, do all sorts of interesting things. And, and one of the primary things that we did was to drive. I learned to drive with my grandfather. And so I would, from time to time, get in the car. And usually it was a car, one of these cars. That's a 68 Impala and I think a, a 55 or 56 Chevy. He had both of those cars, and from, from about the age of five to the age of 15, my brother and I would travel to Haskell, Texas, north of Abilene. How many folks know where Haskell is? It's a small county seat town, like thousands in Texas, and <clears throat> we would travel up and spend a week with my grandfather, maybe two weeks, and we would do all kinds of things, and the thing that we looked forward to most was driving. And so as a child, I remember sitting on a pillow, and my feet wouldn't touch the pedals, but I could hold on to the steering wheel, and my grandfather would sit next to me, or just a little bit apart. It was a bench seat, nothing in between, no bucket seats. The only thing in between was his spittoon. And he would chew tobacco as we would drive and spit as necessary, and he would put his foot on the brake or the gas, as I would drive. Now that's of course not illegal and not recommended. I would be up on a, on a pillow. And, and what I knew, even as I was somewhat intimidated by this gargantuan car thing, I knew it was going to be okay because I was with my granddad. I was in his place. I was in his town where he had been born and raised, where my mother had been born and raised. And I love to go there. And whether we were in town or out of town driving on country roads, no matter what would come, whether we stopped suddenly or went fast, I knew it was going to be okay because I was with my grandpa. And, and I can't ever remember being fearful, even though we did some things that might have caused fear from time to time. I don't ever remember being fearful in that deep sort of, sort of way. My grandfather is the one who showed me most clearly who God is, a sort of unconditional love, the sort of love that wants to take you out driving to see the world. And just as I had no fear when I was with my grandfather, 
God's design is that we would know that this is God's world and that we are God's. And as we go out into that world, God wants us to have no fear. God wants to turn us loose as this incredible blessing in the world. And, and we have charge of a certain amount of, of time, space, place. And God sits right at our side on, on that journey. We were driving once when I got my feet long enough to, to touch the pedals, still sitting on a pillow so I could see, and we were out on a country road north of Haskell near Winard, if you know where Winard is. And my grandfather uh, got us on a road and said, now Mark, this is a long road and you can just go for a long time, but keep the tires in the ruts. It was basically a one-lane country road, and, and you could see where the tires had cut their mark. If you met somebody, you had to slow down and get over, and there happened to be bar ditches three or four feet deep on either side. Kind of scary to me. And he said, go. He took a chew and started to spit, and I, I gave it some gas, and I was going just a little bit, maybe 10 or 15 miles an hour, and finally my grandfather said, Mark, there's nobody else on this road. It's wide open. You're not going to meet anybody. Get up to speed. Go ahead and punch it. And so I punched it, and we kind of did this, and it was, uh, it was exciting, a little bit intimidating, but exciting. And then in a short amount of time, all of a sudden, I wasn't like this, but I was a little more like this. I don't remember turning the wheel, but all of a sudden, we were headed into the bar ditch. And I felt my grandfather's hand grab the wheel and right the ship. Turns out he also swallowed his tobacco, but that's for another time. <laughs> and then he gave me back control, and, and we, we went on. God's design is that, that we have some control and some authority given by God, and it's, it's the depth of this relationship that determines our fear level and how comfort we are. And just as I had no fear when I was with my grandfather, God wants us to have no fear when we're in this world. We'll be scared from time to time, but that sort of fear that, that we see in Numbers 14, where they, they kind of wanted to go back to Egypt because of the fear of what they they encountered when they crept into the promised land. Hmm. Part of God's design and desire for us is that because of the depth of our relationship, because we know who holds the future, even if we don't know very far down the road, not as far as we would like to go, uh, God's design is that we would be that people and persons who speak to others' anxiety and fear and offer a calming presence so that when people believe or think the sky is falling, that, that all is going downhill, that we would be the voice that says, God is with us. We are not alone. And no matter what comes, we're going to be okay because of, of this relationship, because of the one whose hand we hold. I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot as I've been driving around of folk who seem to think that the sky is falling. I heard the same thing four years ago when the election turned out differently. And now a different group of people are saying the same thing in the second verse, that the sky is falling. God wants to use us as these incredible ambassadors out there, when we meet them along the road, to remind them that we live in God's world, we're not alone, and that fear, or lack of fear in us, is primarily a result of this relationship and how deep and abiding it is, so that when we speak a word of grace or hope, it's actually believed I think of how the sky is falling for many and how oftentimes uh, people might <clears throat> get distracted as if there's kids in the back that are arguing and, and it's hard to stay focused on the road. And, and, you know, those who think the sky is falling need to hear that, 
that word of grace. And oftentimes, those who think the sky are falling are, are, are biting at each other and snipping at each other. And we have that wonderful opportunity, no matter where we are on any sort of issue, to be that people, that person who offers calm and that reminder that we don't know the road ahead, but we do know who holds the future. I think even Jesus struggled with kids in the back. I was reminded recently of how Matthew was a tax collector. The writer of Matthew's gospel was a tax collector. And and tax collectors had one particular way of dealing in their political environment. That was an environment where the Romans had authority and nobody who was captive by them, so to speak, enjoyed their authority and not particularly the Jews. And they, like so many, just wanted freedom and wanted that gone. And Matthew, as a tax collector, was somebody who worked with that oppressive authority to help keep the oppressive authority satisfied. On the other side was Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot was part of the Sicarii, a group of what you might call radicals, on the other end of where Matthew was in terms of how do you deal with the political atmosphere. And they believed in taking a blade and sticking the Roman soldiers and cutting their throats any time they encountered them. A very different way of moving politically. And yet Jesus called them both to be disciples. And he put them in the back seat. And I kind of imagine Jesus driving a mid-60s VW hippie van and, and the rest of the Trinity is here beside and all those disciples are in the back and the issues that separate us are important issues. But how we interact really determines something profound in our lives, in our world. Sometimes... The struggle in the back seat gets us distracted from what's ahead and and distracts us even from the one who sits at our side. I was in the back seat driving to Haskell. I mean, I wasn't driving. I was little. And we would make that trip from Corpus Christi all the way up there. It seemed like it was a 12-hour long trip. And when we would get there, my grandfather would be at the door waiting for us with an apron on and chicken fried steak and cream gravy and homemade french fries, whether it was 10 o'clock at night or 5 in the afternoon. I looked forward to that. He looked forward to that. And we had stopped to get gas, and I had a, I had a Coca-Cola in a glass bottle, and I had already popped the top off, of course, and I like to take the bottle and flip it up real fast, and it'd make the foam come up, and then I'd put my mouth over it to keep it from doing it. My cheeks would get real big, and I guess maybe my parents knew I enjoyed that. I remember my mom or dad saying, son, don't shake that bottle, which then kind of gave me the idea to shake the bottle, and so I shook the bottle and tried to keep my thumb on it, and I was successful, and so I shook it again. And I was not successful. And that spray went all over my father and my mother in the seat. And then the car stopped. And my dad got out and he opened the car door. He didn't say anything. He reached in and grabbed what was left of that Coca-Cola and poured it out as he looked at me. And then he set it back on the floorboard and got back in the driver's seat. And we went on. Sometimes there's a bunch of noise back there that that you need to take care of. Things that are kind of in the back of your mind or, or things that you're focusing on and so you're not focusing on the road and you're not focusing on the, the relationship. There's a time when you need to, to deal with what's, what's in that back seat. Hmm. <clears throat> Two or three weeks ago, I got a call from a reporter from one of the local TV stations. She asked if I would do an interview with her. I asked her what it was about. She said it was about the shooting of the United Methodist pastor up in East Texas you might have heard about. It wasn't a church shooting, so to speak. It just happened to be a shooting that was in a church and the pastor got killed. 
She asked me about gun control, about concealed carry, about all sorts of things that are always brought up. And then she wanted to do a camera interview. And so I asked her, is it the sort of thing where you'll interview me and kind of get my side and, uh, of that, and then you'll find somebody else who has a differing opinion, and then you'll describe what went on, and then that'll kind of be it. And she said, yeah, that's kind of it. And so I declined that interview. She asked why. I said, because I, I don't think there's any value in that. There's no value in that in society. It, it offers no perspective. It offers no solutions. It's just kind of like noise in the back. It, it, it has this appearance of importance, and, but it, it, it's really just this distracting sort of thing that sometimes you just need to open the door of the things that, that stir you up and let those things out and then close that door so that you can once again be in that driver's seat as God intended, focused on where God wants you to go, and developing that relationship more and more. What are the fears that are in the back seat of your life? The noises, the, the things that are just a distraction, that have the appearance maybe of something valuable, but are not really very helpful at all. One time I was driving. I didn't need a pillow anymore, but I still sat a little forward and my feet could work the, the pedals. And I was driving about 30 miles an hour. It was a, a, a wide open spaces, uh, no bar ditches, but there were crops left and right. And up ahead, I could see that there was a bridge or a structure. And my granddad said, now, Mark, when, uh, there's going to be a curve up here to the right, and you just hold your speed. He was teaching me how to not just come down and, and speed, but to hold. This is, had been a familiar sort of lesson. I said, okay. I was feeling pretty good. What my granddad knew is that the bridge had rickety boards on it. And as I turned, keeping my speed, and then immediately straightened, I was on the bridge. And the bridge was very thin. And so that wide open spaces came into this short little view. And both of those were a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit scary, because I was going 35, 40 miles an hour. And, and, and as soon as I hit those boards, there came this roar from under the, the car. And then my grandfather said, bridge at the top of his lungs. And I was startled and I was scared. And, 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 and I even wondered about safety for a brief second because of this pinchedness. And, and I had no idea what was coming. And, and yet, the laughter of my grandfather reminded me of how safe I was, of how I was going to be okay. Our God delights in us and wants to celebrate with us and help shape us and be with us as we're driving down that road of life. It is the depth of that relationship born over time of things that build trust. Religion doesn't necessarily build trust or relationship. Just coming to church, just going through whatever way of worship that is normal, that, that doesn't necessarily build what God intends. It takes intention, and there's certainly intention on God's part it's the intention on our part that really determines how deep that relationship will grow and of how, how it will dispel those fears or, or confirm those fears. So we're in Numbers 14. It's where Moses has, has driven right up to the promised land with all the people in the back. God at his side, directing, and they're only a few months away from the exodus, and they're right up to the promised land. And God tells Moses to get out and open the door and send in 12 spies into the promised land to scope it out. And so here go 12 spies, and one from each tribe, and they wait for a couple of months, 
And they come back and they give their report. And, and all but two, all but two, give a bad report and a fearful report. And they say, this is a terrible land and that we shouldn't go in it. We're scared. If only we had died in Egypt or in the desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? But there were two, Joshua and Caleb. They had, they had seen the same thing. They had all seen the same thing. But Joshua and Caleb well, they had a different response. They said, we need to go in there because of this relationship. But the people, they, they kept whining and, and bellyaching, I guess you might say. And, and here we are right at the promised land. And my suspicion is, is that God kind of <coughs> spits a little bit and says, Moses, turn the car around. We're going to wander in the desert for 40 years until this relationship and the relationship that way is at such a level that we're ready to go into the promised land. So oftentimes the promised land that we hope to be in to get to is so, so dependent upon our building that relationship. Not religious practice, mind you, because Jesus had lots of things to say about religious practice and those who who were very good at that, but it's that relationship that is so key. So part of what has been before you at any given time during this series, Unafraid, is the study guide. This is a piece out of St. Ignatius's exercises. St. Ignatius is the one who created the Jesuit order of the priesthood. And for 1,500 plus years, every priest, as part of what they go through, goes through the spiritual exercises. It's, it's focused on developing this relationship. And it's the sort of thing that <clears throat> brings fullness and joy. And so I, I want to encourage you to that again, either what we have here or, or other things. It's not a, a magic bullet by any mean, but... but by focusing more on this relationship, it frees us from the sorts of fears. The fears that we think and truly are out there. Because we don't know what's coming down the road. But we do know the one that we ride with. So what are the fears, those top three fears, that stir in your heart and soul? What are the things that that God is hoping to develop more and more of a relationship that those fears might, might not have control of us and that we would be fully available for God despite our fears. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, remind us this day of your incredible love for us. Remind us this day of how you do not leave us alone. Remind us this day that you can handle all of our fears. Remind us this day that you desire even more of a relationship and, and particularly a deeper relationship, the very sort of thing that would offer us a freedom from those things that we are afraid of. We seek that word of comfort. And we ask all of this in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen.